Let's get into this word Kesher or connection. And we are talking today in our last message on connection, that connection to God helps us choose wisely. Connection to God helps us choose wisely. So if we go to Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 26, and then later on we'll be going to Proverbs 14. But Deuteronomy eleven twenty six says this. See, I am setting before you today a blessing and a curse. If we were to continue on in verse 27, it says, The blessing if you obey the commands of the Lord your God that I'm giving you today. And in verse 28, 28, the curse if you disobey the commands of the Lord that I'm giving you today. See, I'm setting before you today a blessing and a curse. The first word of this verse is very important. And it is the word in Hebrew, re'e. And re'e doesn't just mean see, like I see something. I look out and I see you. It's a, it's a deeper meaning. It means sort of to perceive, to really see something the way that it actually is. And it's important that this word is in there. We believe that the Bible is inspired by God and it's inerrant. It doesn't have any errors in it. And so we, we understand that this word re'e, this word see, is there on purpose. God just isn't saying here through Moses, I set before you today a blessing and a curse, but rather see that I set before you today a blessing and a curse. So what does that mean? Well, the problem is sometimes we see something that is destructive, something that is negative. We see a curse, if you will, as a blessing. How many times in our own lives or in lives of others have we seen where they got involved in a destructive relationship or behavior or substance or lifestyle that was contrary to what God wants, contrary to what the Bible says, because they thought that it would bring them happiness. How many of us in our own life, in our own past, before we really committed to the Lord, would see things in the world and think, well, this is going to make my life better. This is the answer that I've been looking for. There's a running joke in the first Muppet movie. Uh, I really enjoy the Jim Henson and the Muppets. So there's a running joke in, in, the, in the first Muppet movie where anytime someone says, oh, I feel lost, or that guy's lost, or whatever. It's a half a dozen times in that movie, oh, this guy's lost. Maybe he should try Harry Krishna. I mean, that, that was kind of a, a thing back in the day. I mean, especially throughout the 80s as I was a kid growing up, it just seemed like at every airport there was a bunch of Krishnas there. I mean, do you remember that? It was, you know, it, it just was one of those things where the latest and greatest, whatever was in style at the moment, spiritual pursuit you know, I think today probably the latest spiritual pursuit uh, du jour is yoga. You know, everybody and their grandma is doing yoga. And let me just give you a, a, a word of caution. Be careful with yoga. You don't understand how religious yoga is, and it's not a religion that we're into. It's a pagan, godless religion where the reason that you pose this way is that the belief in yoga is that the energy in your body can escape through your fingertips. And so you need to put your fingers together to make a loop like a circuit so your energy will not escape. Be very careful in the things that you do. You may be practicing idolatry and not know it. Just a word of caution from a pastor to you. Be careful of, of yoga. It is a part of a religion. Um, nothing wrong with doing physical exercise and things like that, but just be careful with with how much religiosity you put into your life that is not biblical. That's my soapbox there. So see today, I'm sending before you a blessing and a curse. The whole idea is that we need to perceive what is really a blessing and what is really a curse. Because sometimes the world will give you a bait and switch. Yeah. Yeah. Our enemy, the devil, will give you a bait and switch. He will put forth a curse as if it is a blessing. You know, we are in a society today that has a morality that's non-existent, especially with regard to intimacy and sexuality. And this is the result of a generation that is the grandkids of the free love people. This is the spiritual result of going through the 60s and do whatever feels good and free love and open relationships when you teach that morality to children and then they teach that morality to their children, that's what we get today. That we, we are reaping what we've sowed. We have a, a, a society where things that are not biblical, things that would be a curse, so to speak, are looked at as a blessing. You know, the Bible says that we need to, to watch out 
you know, woe to the person that calls good evil and evil good. And that's, that's where we're living today. So we need to perceive the true difference between the blessing and the curse. And we need to choose the blessing. So we must choose between the blessing and the curse. Now, here's the bad news. You can't live in between. You must make a choice. You must make a choice. You know, there's a very famous song by the band Rush that says, if you choose not to decide, you still have made a choice. You can't just say, well, I'm, I'm not going to choose between the blessing and the curse. That, that, is, a, that is a choice. It's, it's either God or not. It, it's either you're, you're either with Him or, or you're against Him. Right. So first we must see the difference. First we must perceive the difference between the blessing and the curse. Now, the things of this world can cloud our vision. The things of this world can cloud our vision. We can have a good grasp on what's the difference between what's good and evil. But the problem is, it, it's almost like... Uh, you ever done that thing, you, you that wear glasses, I, I wear glasses a lot. Have you ever done that thing where you go from the air-conditioned house or the air-conditioned car yeah. into the very humid floor to outdoors, and all of a sudden, you're just fog city. Yeah. I don't know about you, I have to stop wherever I'm at and remedy that. I will run into something. <laughs> you know, it's, it's almost like you wish you had little windshield wipers on your, on your glasses. Sometimes you do that. We, we're giving uh, Rabbi Shapira, the head rabbi in the school that I'm a part of, uh, was here with his family doing some filming with me for our, our uh, what's called Shuvu Yeladim, where his son Noah and Chomp the Shark teach uh, the Hebrew alphabet and biblical concepts to Messianic Jewish kids. And we were giving him a tour of the, the food pantry, and wouldn't you know, it exactly happened. We opened up one of the freezers and walked into it, and you know, my glasses were just uh, useless. That's what happens in, in the world. You see, we are acclimated to a certain spiritual climate. And then when we walk out into the world, it's a whole different ballgame, and our vision can be clouded. We have to watch out for that. The things of this world can cloud our vision. Let me give you this verse in Proverbs that I was talking to you about, and then I'm going to give you another verse in Proverbs that is really sad but it really speaks to what our generations are going through right now. First of all, let's go to Proverbs 14, 12. Proverbs 14, 12. And this, by the way, goes along with Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Some of you have memorized Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. What does that say? Trust in the Lord with how much of your heart? All of your heart. And lean not on what? Your own understanding. Wow. I was really enjoying what BJ played for the offering, and I was having that line in my mind, though the eye of sinful man your glory may not see. Sometimes this world clouds our vision, and we can't really see what it's really all about. Proverbs 14, 12. Let's read this. There is a way that appears to be right, but in the end it leads to death. There is a way that appears to be right, but in the end it leads to death. Let's also go to this other verse in Proverbs, Proverbs 27, 7. Proverbs 27, 7, one of the most sad verses to me but certainly, absolutely true. Proverbs 27, 7. One who is full loathes honey from the comb, but to the hungry, even what is bitter tastes sweet. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is where we live. That's where the world is right now. To the one who is full... The honey from the comb isn't attractive anymore. One who is full loathes honey from the comb. Even though it's, it's sweet, it's good, it's delicious. How many of you know that King David compares God's word to honey more than once? It's like if you're full with the stuff of this world, even the sweet taste of the word of God, what does the Bible say? Taste and see that the Lord is good. 
But you can't even be bothered with that because you're so full of everything else. But to the one who is hungry, even what is bitter tastes sweet. You see, the problem is the world is full. It's full of itself. It's full of its own appetites and desires. Its own greed, its own lust, its own wanting to look out for its own. It's so full that when we offer the goodness of God, sometimes it's like, I'm just just full. I'm just, I don't even want that sweetness. But the opposite is true as well. The next part of the verse, the world is starving and it doesn't realize it. And so when the world is starving, even what is bitter tastes sweet. And so this is why people get involved in awful, abusive relationships and they keep going back and back and back. This is why people, when not properly presented with the gospel, why they keep going back to their old ways and their old habits because they know it. And if you're starving, even what is bitter tastes sweet. If you're starving, any little bit of attention will seemingly satisfy you. And so that's why people get involved in these awful situations and relationships because they say, well, at least they're paying me some attention even though it's abusive. You know, yes, I feel awful afterwards, but if I do this substance, if I drink this drink, if I do this drug, at least in the immediate, I, I, I feel numb from the pain of this world. Even though that's a bitter experience, it tastes sweet to me because I'm starving for any type of positivity. It's a real problem. And so since the world is starving, they'll gobble up what is really bitter, but it seems sweet to them. And then by the time we try to give them the truth of the gospel, they're like, well, I'm just kind of full up with all this other stuff. But it's empty. It's empty. Once we see the difference... Remember this word, re'e, to perceive, to see, to really notice the difference between what is good and what is evil, what is life and what is death, what is the blessing and what is the curse. Once we see it, we must choose what's good, even if it doesn't taste good in the moment. Because the things of God sometimes do not have the most immediate, delicious taste as some sinful things. It's better in the long run. It's like... It's like healthy food doesn't immediately have that reaction of something that is greasy, salty, or sweet. I mean, listen, bad food is delicious. But you have that awful feeling afterward. You know what I mean? You have that that sort of crash afterward. When you have to make a choice between something healthy and something awful... Something awful is like the immediate deliciousness, but it doesn't have the long run good properties that, you know, that healthy food does. It's the same thing in our spiritual life. It's the same thing in our spiritual life. There's a stand up comedian that I really love, and he talks about being criticized for loving McDonald's because McDonald's is so awful. And he says, I don't eat it all the time, but I like McDonald's, but don't judge me. You like McDonald's too. It's just a different kind of McDonald's. Some of you read Us Weekly. It's McDonald's. Some of you read tabloids. Some of you, you know, whatever it is. We, some of you love gossip. That's just McDonald's. Tastes great in the moment. Feel awful afterward. It's all McDonald's. It's a great point. It really is. It's... Some of us actually struggle with the actual McDonald's. You know? The struggle is real. (laughs) But I'm I'm continuing to work on it. Woo! Awesome. (laughs) Sometimes the things of God don't have the appeal to our flesh. But man, when we start perceiving what is a blessing and what is a curse, we start living by the Spirit. Ah, it's a whole different ballgame. So let me ask us some hard questions. Why do we have in our society abusive relationships? Why do we have confusion about gender identity? 
Why do we have substance abuse? Why do we have feelings of guilt? It's because we've been unable to see the curse. We thought it was a blessing. If I just do this, I will feel fulfilled. If I just do this. Listen, there's a lot of confusion in our world today about gender identity. Getting a surgery to change your gender is not going to make you feel any more fulfilled. Look at the scientific statistics, even by people that aren't believers. Of course, morally, we believe that it's not right to surgically change your God-given sex. But just look at the statistics on the, on the regret of people think because of this confusion or because of this abuse past or because of this whatever, that if I just have this surgery, that will make me whole. It doesn't. If I just do this thing over here, it will make me whole. If I just can find the right person to date or to marry, that will make me whole. Listen, if you and Jesus as a package deal are not whole, you will never be whole with another human being. You've got to find your completeness in God and in God alone. And that person that comes along is an incredible blessing. But life ain't Jerry Maguire. She don't complete you. He doesn't complete you. There's only one being in the universe that can do that. They can help you. I'm coming up this week on 22 years of marriage. Happy anniversary, honey. To the same woman, which is, which is odd in this day and age. I'm not criticizing anyone, but I've actually heard people use the line, I've been married 25 years, four different women, but I've been married 25, you know. <laughs> I have to look at my wife as a helpmeet, and I'm a helpmeet for her, but we don't complete each other. How sad would it be if we looked at each other as completing one another and then something happened to the other? Please pray for our friend John, whose wife Dawn died very suddenly last week. We've been praying for her with pancreatic cancer and they were working very hard behind the scenes. Um, we were trying to get her on a clinical study for a cancer drug in Israel that's absolutely miraculous. And we were working to make that happen and she very suddenly died. And we had the funeral for her this, this past Thursday and it's very, very sad. And her husband John has said to me, I, I just don't know how I'm gonna go on. I can't even imagine that pain. I haven't lost a spouse. Some of you in here have. But I'll tell you this. It's only your connection with God and Him completing you that's going to get you through something so tragic as the death of a loved one. Let's pray this morning that, that God give us a, a supernatural vision a supernatural perception of being able to tell the difference between what is a blessing and what is a curse. None of us in here, in our right minds, would choose something evil. None of us would do that. Once you have tasted and seen that the Lord is good, you would never say, oh, I'm going to willingly choose something that's a curse, choose something that's of death, choose something that's evil. None of us would do that. But our enemy knows that. So what he has to do is try to trick us. Yes. Try to fog our glasses, so to speak. So we're going to pray that God give you a, a spiritual vision that is better than 2020. That you be able to perceive with your spirit what is good and what is evil. I've mentioned this before, but I'll say it again before we pray. There are two very specific stories in the Bible where people were in jail and supernaturally the jail doors flew open. But in each of those stories, a very different result happened. See, one time Peter was in jail and the jail door flew open and he was supposed to walk out and be free. But one time Paul and Silas were singing praises to God in the middle of the night and an earthquake happened and the jail door flew open and they were supposed to stay put. 
And knowing that in our spiritual perception, knowing that, that makes all the difference. Is the Lord telling me to move? Is the Lord telling me to stay put? Because Paul and Silas stayed put, a Roman jailer and his family came to faith because they stayed. Would you pray with me? Lord, I pray right now in the power of your Holy Spirit that you would give us a spiritual perception, that you would give us a a better than 2020 physical vision to perceive the difference between what is good for us eternally and what is not. Lord, that you would give us a a sense, a spiritual sense of knowing beyond any doubt this is what is right and I'm going to go this way. Lord, I pray that when the door is open and we're supposed to walk through it, that we know it. And when the door is open and it's a test and we're supposed to stay put, that we'd know that as well. And Lord, I pray that we not only would have this spiritual sense, I pray that we would have the courage and the boldness to warn others of the destruction coming their way if they can't perceive what is a blessing and a curse. Lord, we're trusting you and we're counting on you because you are reliable. You are the one that can open our spiritual eyes, open our eyes that we may see. Hashem Yeshua Meshichenu, in the name of Jesus, our Messiah, our Christ. We pray all these things. Amen and amen. The world is going to try to deceive you this week. They're going to try to trick you into thinking something that's bad is really good. But you, through the power of the Holy Spirit, are going to be able to see through all of the smoke and mirrors of the enemy. I'll leave you with this. When you warn someone about the curse they're involved in or about to be involved in, think with an eternal perspective. Think with love and grace. You can warn someone before they take that leap into the curse You can do that. But once they've done it, it is pointless for you to sermonize on why they shouldn't have gotten involved in that. Now is not the time. Now they need help. I mentioned on our new podcast that there was a woman in Arkansas just a few days ago that drowned in a flash flood inside her vehicle. She called 911 and for 20 minutes was crying out to this 911 operator, please help me, I don't want to die, I can't swim. And the woman on the other line berated her, the dispatcher berated her, made fun of her, and said things like, well, you shouldn't have driven into the water, surely you had to see it. Basically treated the woman like she was stupid as she was dying. And eventually the first responders got to her, but only after she had drowned. It is immaterial, even if it was the woman's fault that she drove into a flash flood place that she thought she could get through. That doesn't matter anymore. Now she's drowning. When the people around us don't see the trap of the enemy, they don't see that it's a curse, and now they're drowning. For us to say, well, you shouldn't have done that. Well, you're just ignorant. You're just evil. You're just a bad person. If they're drowning, we got to get them out. 
it is no longer the time for a sermon. You can warn them before they go into that flash flood. Hey, listen, I don't think you should try it. Don't even, don't even attempt it. But once they're drowning, how callous is it? How callous is it for this dispatcher to berate this woman who's afraid of drowning and then she died? We would never do that. But don't do it in your spiritual life. Once they're there, it's like they're a prisoner of war. We got to rescue them. We got to get them out. We got to save that soul. The Bible says, snatch them from the fire in the book of James. Snatch them from the fire. How good would it do us if they're in the fire and you go, well, you deserve to burn. That, it, it sounds silly to even say that, but that's what this dispatcher did. Don't be like that in your spiritual life. If you perceive the blessing from the curse, warn someone in grace and love. Because I'll tell you what, I don't deserve the mercy and grace of God, and neither do you. Let's rescue them. Let's get souls into the kingdom. Let's warn them. Let's snatch them from the fire. Go today in peace and go with God. You're dismissed.